Please note that the opinions and ideas shared on this podcast are those of the speakers, not the opinions of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society or its board. While medical topics will be discussed, it is not to be taken as strict medical advice and individual clinical judgment is warranted in applying information to patient care. It is the responsibility of the listener to judge for themselves the applicability of the information discussed with regards to their medical practice. Hi, this is Clark Madsen, back again with the Ogden Surgical Medical Society podcast. I am the past president of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society and happy again to be your host for this podcast, where we're going to be talking with some of our local experts in various fields in in medicine, and sometimes we'll even bring in people from outside our region. But today, I am lucky and really excited to talk to Dr. Elise Fazio, who's one of our palliative care specialists here at McKady Hospital. And before we get started, I do have to mention, when we started this podcast, I created a list of like 20 people I wanted to include on this podcast. And at the very top of this was Dr. Fazio. That was awesome. I made the cut. (laughs) You made the cut. Thank you. At the top. And so I'm really excited we're finally able to to get this going. So Dr. Fazio and I, we're going to have a little chat here about uh, her practice in in palliative medicine. And just to give a little introduction for her, uh, she did medical school at Western University of Health Sciences uh, and then did her family medicine residency and palliative care fellowship in Eastern Maine. And Uh, We're really lucky to have her come and join us here. She's been here in Ogden for the past three years and is currently the uh, director of our palliative care program here at McKay Hospital, which which has grown a lot recently. It has, uh, what do we have, 15 providers, and we're providing both inpatient, outpatient, even even home care. And so we're going to talk a little bit about that. As we usually do with this, we kind of want to start off with something non-medical. And I heard that you went on some amazing camping trips lately. Do you want to tell us about what you did recently? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So the big news in my life, I just had a baby girl. Yes. Thank you. Her name is Sophia. Sophia. And so she's almost three months old. And uh, we felt very much ahead of ahead of having her that we wanted to continue our passions, live our life and uh, not get slowed down necessarily by a baby. Although of course your life changes. Um, But we went camping down in Wire Mesa um, in Southern Utah with some friends for their birthday. People were mountain biking, hiking, and she came along and she did great. We had a little R-Pod camper and she slept over on the table. You know, we slept on the mattress and she slept on the table in her little dock tot and did great and hung out with everyone around the campfire and the hikes. And it was great. So that was our last little vacation time away. That's wonderful. Mm-hmm. I was going to say camping with a six week old is brave. Yes. It, yeah, that's brave. what everyone said. And you know what? I, like I told you before, she's somehow amazingly sleeping through the night and so I said the only re- the only way we're doing this is if she's sleeping through the night and we're not tent camping I'm like I don't know about tent camping but we had a little glamping with the art pod so yeah well you got to start off somewhere yeah you know, eventually you know maybe by by uh, six months you'll be backpacking right <laughs> that was my <laughs> husband would hope for that so <laughs> we'll see so thanks for asking yeah, yeah. wonderful well, you um, have taken a interesting role. There's not a lot of palliative care physicians uh, out there. I mean, it's a, it seems to be a growing field. And while I think most of our listeners would know what palliative care medicine is, there's sometimes a lot of misconceptions sure. around it. Maybe you can kind of tell us from your point of view, what do you do as a palliative care physician? Sure. You bring up a good point too. You know, palliative care is not a new medical specialty. It's been a known specialty of healthcare for a while. And people were practicing palliative care before it was called palliative care, but it's now being recognized more vastly and accepted more widely. So it's become uh, more of a standard uh, consultant team at our hospitals across our state and nation and world really. So as a palliative care physician, I have the opportunity of taking care of people um, in the home setting, in our clinic setting, and on the inpatient setting in the hospital. I personally mainly work in the hospital leading our inpatient consultative service. 
Um, and then I have a team in those other locations. So we are a consultant uh, service that specializes in supporting people and families who have a serious illness that is usually life limiting, terminal or life threatening. And so we tend to see people who have diseases such as dementia, end stage renal disease, end stage liver disease, an aggressive metastatic cancer, strokes, and uh, I'm sure I'm missing some, maybe COPD, mm -hmm. that's a, one we see a lot. And so we specialize in seeing those, for, those folks and helping them understand what their treatment options are, help understand the goals in their care, whether they're still trying to pursue curative treatment, like curing their cancer, or maybe they're on a palliative route of chemotherapy where they can't cure the cancer, but they can slow down the, the rate of growth, or maybe they're ready for hospice. So we help them determine those goals. And in doing so, some other major aspects of our care is we can manage symptoms related to their serious illness, like pain, nausea, fatigue, um, so symptom management. And then lastly, really advanced care planning, which is mm -hmm. just the term we use for documenting people's health wishes and advanced directive, post forms, and just making sure that they are at the center of their care and that their wishes are honored throughout their disease trajectory. Mm -hmm. So that's kind of a big bird's eye perspective of what we do across all three sites of service, home, clinic, and inpatient. As an inpatient palliative care provider, you know, I really tend to see the sickest of the sick. I see a lot of crisis care where people are coming in with exacerbations of their chronic illness, a lot of ICU care, a lot of ICU work, and really collaboration with all the other referring teams. So I really like my job. It's, it's really rewarding. It is frequently misunderstood. A lot of times we get confused with hospice. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. <laughs> happy to elaborate on that now or, you know, the differences. But that's really our work in a nutshell is to support the patients, the families, and even the staff taking care of them to mm -hmm. support referring hospitalists, other physicians, because these can be, you know, really difficult situations. Like I said, these can be the worst moments of people's lives and of, and of the family. So uh, again, we're there to support. Um, since I brought it up, I can briefly talk about the differences between hospice and palliative medicine or. Yeah, yeah. I mean, my thought, my question along with that line is, you know, I mean, I think being a, a family physician myself, I, I kind of can generally understand the difference between palliative care and Great. hospice, but oftentimes the two can be get muddled together, especially when you're having a patient who's really sick and you're starting to think about hospice, how, how do you differentiate the palliative care part versus hospice versus just pain management, for example? Sure. So to answer your last question first, you know, just pain management, I tend to think of our people who have chronic pain and maybe not a life limiting illness, perhaps mm -hmm. fibromyalgia or a pain syndrome that doesn't affect their, you know, mortality or their life expectancy, but deserves close attention. And that's usually managed by a chronic pain clinic. Sometimes we get those referrals. And so we'll see the patient and give our recommendations that they would be better suited uh, in a chronic pain clinic. Referring to the differences with palliative and hospice, many times we're confused uh, for hospice because we tend, some, sometimes we get involved so late in their illness trajectory at the very, very end of their, of their illness. Um, and we quickly do an assessment and realize that really hospice best lines up with their wishes and would be the best team to support them, that we see them quickly and then refer to hospice. And so I think that's where we tend to get confused and mislabeled is because sometimes we get involved really late. Mm -hmm. our, our goal in general is to get involved upstream. Mm -hmm. And there's different initiatives we are working on here at McKay, um, McKay Hospital and then Intermountain across the system to get involved early so we can develop rapport with these people um, help maximize their palliative or curative care, and then help them one day, if, if it happens in that case, help them one day transition to hospice care. Mm -hmm. So two separate services, 
palliative care, again, is a consulting service. Hospice is like a primary care service. They really take over the whole care of the patient. So hopefully that gives some insight into those nuances that you were referring to. Yeah, no, it definitely does. And, and generally kind of time frame wise, we're thinking mm. hospice right at the end. We kind of know sure. the writing's on the wall. Yeah. Something's going to happen fairly soon. Palliative care, that's an important piece that I think oftentimes get missed is it's not, there's no end date in right. mind. There's not a limitation. So what kind of guidance can you give us about when hospice uh, I'm sorry, when a palliative consult would be appropriate? Sure. To elaborate even further, you know, hospice, that standard approach is you tend to think of the person in the last six months of their life. Mm -hmm. Although many people in the community think hospice is for when I'm dying and I have two days left. Yeah. <laughs> because many times they see hospice get involved late. Mm -hmm. uh, but to back up, um, if you find yourself taking care of a patient and you're asking yourself questions such as, um, what is this person's prognosis? How do I de deliver difficult news to this patient and manage the follow-up of this new diagnosis? They're having really difficult um, time managing their pain related to a cancer diagnosis. And I'm having, I'm having difficulties managing it myself or I'm getting into a situation that's uncomfortable for me. All of those times are certainly appropriate for referrals to our team. Um, when you really just feel like the patient and family need more support with a terminal illness mm -hmm. and uh, more support than you can provide. So again, um, let's give some examples. So maybe you have an elderly patient with dementia and the family needs some good education about the trajectory of dementia, what to expect, how to plan for the future, for caregiving, what medical complications to expect, when hospice would be appropriate, um, how to manage those really difficult symptoms like agitation or insomnia. You know, those are good examples of maybe when to refer a dementia patient to our service. Similarly, let's say you have a patient with, again, cancer, it's now turned, you know, it's now turned, their goal is now palliative treatment rather than curative treatment. Um, that's another great time to refer. Or again, a patient with any of these conditions at any stage of their illness. Again, the earlier, the better, because mm -hmm. we can get ahead of things and we can, uh, I think, execute better care for the rest of their, their illness. So those are just some situations that would help you understand when to refer. And if you're mm -hmm. ever in doubt, just send the referral. You know, we're always happy to see people and give okay. you feedback on where or how that patient can be best cared for. Yeah, yeah, get it. And this is, uh, I think this is the kind of the point in the podcast where we kind of uh, transition into the, the segment I'm going to call Think Like a Palliative Care Physician. Oh, nice. Uh, so uh, <laughs> because you brought up this point that there's a lot of, uh, there is a lot of really critical discussions that you're having mm -hmm. with your patients, difficult ones. And sometimes it's not even with the patient. I mean, sure. especially with things like dementia, right. you, you're oftentimes having these conversations with loved ones. And so it can create some very tricky situations yeah. to navigate. Definitely. Uh, and so I want to spend a little bit of time talking about that. My thought process on this is one of the reasons that this can be especially tricky is our jobs as physicians are oftentimes are usually to advise our patients, give them their options and allow them to make decisions. But sometimes we get in situations such as end-of-life decisions where the patients don't really have a good framework to, to know what the right choice is. And if there's either a tendency to be overly paternalistic and say, you just need to do this, you need to do option A, and this is what you definitely need to do. Um, and then there's also on the flip side, you can be of the mindset where I have no opinion in this, here are all of your options, good luck, right. you choose and go from there. How sure. do you navigate this minefield? Yeah, great question. I will say it takes a lot of experience. It takes a lot of trial and error. It, take, it took fellowship training, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I have learned what to say and what not to say <laughs> or how to say it. And I'm still learning. Mm -hmm. You know, I think the thing to think about when you're having these difficult conversations is to first and foremost, meet the patient and the family where they're at. Mm -hmm you know, make sure you first understand what is their understanding of the illness? What is, what's their agenda? What are their objectives? 
because if you start out on the wrong foot, it's gonna, it'll, it, it might be hard to recover from that. Um, but the bioethics of medicine and how it relates to palliative care is certainly one of those passions of mine um, and a skill that I'm constantly looking to master. And so you brought up multiple tenets of modern ethics between medical paternalism, which speaks more to that non-malfeasance and beneficence piece of medicine mm -hmm. versus autonomy and really respecting a patient's choice. So we're constantly balancing those topics in these difficult conversations with patients and families. And sometimes I take, I go from one end of the spectrum to the next. I might lean into autonomy a little bit more but I think every successful conversation has pieces of all of those things. I find that we, we are doing a disservice to our patients and families if we do not make some sort of recommendation. So I do think we fail a patient and family when we leave it completely in their court and we're letting them make medical decisions that really they're not informed to make, whether it's a code status discussion or putting in a feeding tube for a dementia patient or pursuing fourth line chemotherapy for a patient who's um, got a metastatic cancer and is cachectic mm -hmm. and is just, their functional status is really poor. So I think every conversation as a physician, um, these kind of conversations, you should have a recommendation at the end. And you, you know, you have to feel out your patient and family. Some, some want a recommendation right off the bat. Some want to share their thoughts at first. But um, I think we should balance the balance should be a little a, autonomy for sure, but a little less autonomy and a little more of a, you know, paternalistic approach. Mm -hmm. Because again, that's our, that's like you said, that's our role as a physician is to guide patients to find care that will benefit them the most that lines up with their, their goals of care and um, to not set them up for failure. Mm -hmm. This also highlights for me an issue that I'm constantly working at and constantly trying to support other physicians is the topic of non-beneficial care, previously called futile care, or how you draw the line between a patient demanding care that won't benefit them. Yeah, that's a tough discussion. That's a tough one. And I, I, you know, I've learned in getting to know administration and in getting to know the bioethics team that it's complicated mm -hmm. and there's um, a lot of different perspectives on that issue. And as much as I want it to be black and white and I want to favor on the side of the physician to really be the one leading the discussion and saying, listen, we can't offer this treatment, but we can't offer this. It's more nuanced than that. To summarize, <laughs> I really think the best thing first is to you know, build rapport, earn trust on the patient's uh, family and, and the patient. And then also incorporate your support staff, which mm. we're blessed to have in palliative care, which is chaplain support and social work support, so that we can just provide a treatment plan that reflects their wishes, but really guide them through it. And at the end of the day, say, this is what I recommend as your physician. Well, that's wonderful. I think that the, the idea you brought up at the very end is something that I've always struggled with. None of us want to be that physician that says, you know, it, that's enough, or we're not going to look any further. Or we're not going to, we, we, we shouldn't be doing this or that. We all want, always want to be that person who's, hey, let's try something else. Let's keep pushing. Let's keep going further. And knowing when, you know, it takes a little, it takes quite a bit of bravery to stay, tell a patient, like, this is not helping you anymore. This is not in your best interest. And so I imagine that's one of those things you'd mentioned takes some practice to take practice to get comfortable. You know, I've done it way too early in my relationship with the patient. And that, mm. you know, that sometimes doesn't go well. Yeah, you know, we yeah. barely know each other. And I'm coming in and saying, listen, it's time. Well, it was a to good discuss one. These things, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, but but you do, yeah, you do bring up a point in in in. And what I'm getting at is physicians should feel supported to do that. They shouldn't be scared to do mm -hmm. that. They should feel that they have the support of other physicians, you know, their hospital team, um, that they can use their expertise mm -hmm. and, you know, try as hard as they can to accommodate the patient and family's wishes. But at a certain point, you really have to be that expert and you have to step in and, and have that hard conversation. Again, sometimes it goes well, sometimes it doesn't go well. Mm -hmm. But 
what I worry about is I worry about a trend where whatever the patient wants, we do, whatever yeah. the family wants, we do. Um, and that can be harmful. So again, I'm not saying I have the answer. I'm not saying I do this well all the time, um, but I think it can cause harm. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what we really should think about when kind of creating our hospital ethics, really as a society, what we promote and don't promote in medical care. And, and I can see the ease in becoming kind of like a medical store where we lay out the options and say, hey, try all these on, take your pick, right. and we'll support you with whatever we do. It's very tempting because from my point of view, that way I, my responsibility is abated because yeah. I laid out the options and sure. they chose and whatever the consequences are now on them. Yeah. Here you're kind of saying, yeah, but it's also our responsibility to guide them because we are the one with the education. Right. We're the one who can see the future for them better than they can. Right, exactly. And, and every physician has that training and education. And I'm not saying that the palliative care experts have more knowledge. It's mm -hmm. just, we have more practice, I guess. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I have this funny little comic. I took a photo. It's <laughs> hanging on the wall of our office in the palliative care office. And I don't mean, I, hopefully this doesn't sound disrespectful, but it's, you can see it's this doctor. He's sitting behind a desk and he's got his patient in the chair. And the doctor says, there's no easy way I can tell you this. So I'm going to send you to someone who can, <laughs> and it's a little outdated, you know, we find humor in it. I don't mean that again, uh, any, because I do think every referring provider practices, practices primary palliative care. Mm -hmm. um, and many times we're going in and we're just translating for the family and um, speaking just a little more specifically and explicitly about what they're dealing with. Are they dying? Mm -hmm. You know, what is their prognosis? Which treatment options do we really think will benefit them? And which treatment options do we think will not benefit them? Mm -hmm. So that's some of what we do. Yeah. And, and then on top of this, I mean, we all kind of have this shortened version of the uh, Hippocratic Oath in our mind that we don't want to harm the patient and everything we need to be doing is fighting for life as long as possible. Mm -hmm. uh, the one thing I like about palliative medicine, at least my impression of it, is sure. it's not about just giving the patients as much life as possible. It's trying to make it whatever life they have left meaningful. Right. Is that a, is that a fair way to, to look at it? Yes. You know, in simple terms, we say we are looking at quality of life, not just quantity of life. So absolutely. And if we can understand what a person's quality of life is currently or what it will likely be in the future, it can help us uh, understand, again, which treatment path to pursue. So uh, I think you bring up a good point there where, you know, in our discipline in palliative care, our mindset is shifted a little bit. And it's shifted away from fix, cure, mm -hmm. prolong life at all costs to what will benefit the patient based off what they want, based off their situation, based off their clinical status. Um, and, you know, usually it has good results. You know, usually there are patients that fire us. There are patients mm -hmm. that say, hey, I don't want to talk to you um, because of their perception or they're just not ready and that's okay. Mm -hmm but uh, we certainly do our best to understand what a patient's going through. Yeah, kind of shifting on that, because that brings up a point that I've been thinking about too. What, what's the best way, if we're going to refer a patient to palliative care, how can I prime them best so that they go in there with the right mindset? You know, I worry about sending someone mm -hmm. and they go in and they're like, whoa, mm -hmm. I, I'm not ready to talk about this stuff. I'm not sure. ready to go there. Yeah. How, how do we best prep our patients to when we're sending them to you? Yeah, well, I think like my gut reaction to what you just described, if a patient isn't ready, you know, just don't send them. If, if you're really, you, you know this patient well, maybe you've known them for 20 years. Mm -hmm. And if you're just sensing they're not ready, don't push it. They may never be ready or they'll get to a point where they are. So if you feel like they have a good understanding and they're just not ready, that's okay, right? Just visit it, revisit that and follow up visits mm -hmm. um, and can, and start to break down their reasons for maybe not wanting to engage in palliative care because it takes time to understand those reasons. Maybe they had 
a grandfather who had palliative care and, and then hospice and it was a bad experience. Or maybe they're afraid to die because they haven't made amends with their son and they don't even want to think about this kind of consult. So that would be my first piece of advice. Mm -hmm. But my second piece of advice, I guess the way I would phrase it is... I want to provide you, as your physician, I want to provide you with the best tools and support for dealing with COPD, mm -hmm. for dealing with dementia, for dealing with this metastatic cancer. I'm going to continue to serve as your primary care physician or your surgeon or your oncologist, but I want this other team to meet you so they can also support you and me in giving you the best care possible. Um, and some of the things they work on is helping you create that living will you've been meaning to write for years, mm -hmm. helping you decide which child will be your medical power of attorney, you know, helping you with this pain. I, you know, I've kind of reached my limits for what I can do. I really want their expertise and to manage your pain. And, you know, I know you've really been thinking about this surgery and you're weighing the pros and cons. I'd really like you to send, I'd really like to send you this team who can help you think about the surgery even more, find out the best decisions. Those are some things that you can say and do. And if they aren't ready for it, they're not ready Don't for push it. it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's great. And uh, along that line, I mean, we're talk we talked about this a little earlier, but a lot of this is dealing with the patient, mm. but sometimes you're more dealing with the caregivers. Yes. Is there any special tips or tricks you have to dealing with caregivers who are kind of in denial about the, mm. uh, the what's going on with the patient? That's a great question. That's a very complicated question, it I'm is. sure. But... Right, right. There's no easy answer. There's no easy answer. I think whenever you're coming up against denial or some sort of emotional experience of a loved one's illness, so let's say you're working with a daughter and her mom has dementia and she just doesn't see it and she doesn't see the need for certain treatments or limits to care or hospice, you just have to build rapport with that person. So maybe do not hammer it, right? So don't, don't meet their emotion with facts, with medicine, with logic meet their emotion with emotion, mm. right? So denial is a coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. So it's a way for them to deal with their loved one's illness, but to take care of themselves, to shield them from the pain, to shield them from the suffering, to help them cope with the reality of the illness. So let them be in denial for a while. They're, again, they're trying to cope. That is, their, that is their way of protecting themselves. So I really try to not shame someone who's in denial to not, um, again, say you're wrong and I'm right. You got to align with that family member. Yeah. So get to know them, let them express their denial. And over time, you'll start to understand why they're in denial. And over time, I bet you, if they feel that you're on their side and that you're aligned with their goals too, you know, they ultimately want the best care for their loved one. And if they see that that's your goal, they may slowly reveal to you what's going on for them. Huh. They may tell you why they feel a certain way or why they think a certain way. And that's what you need is just to better understand them. You know, one of my attendings in fellowship told me, she said, at least this year, I want you to try to learn how to talk like a taxi driver or a hairdresser. <laughs> Try to forget that you're a physician and that you've trained for this long and that, you know, you speak in a certain language. Try to just talk to people like a hairdresser, mm -hmm. tax driver. Uh, and the more you get to know people, the better, under, the better you'll understand where they're coming from. So kind of what I'm gathering is number one, take time to listen to them, get to know them, kind of see where their perspective is. Then it allows you to kind of talk on their same level, yeah. their same language, meeting them where they are patient with end-stage cancer bringing up the latest New England Journal saying they have three months to live is probably not the thing that's going to help them overcome the denial right. it's kind of you're mentioning it's kind of more listen to them say yeah I you know this is horrible right. for you I'm sure uh what you know what are you thinking right now what is going on through your mind yeah what are you hoping what for? are you hoping for okay that can reveal a lot about denial mm. And, and that's one yeah. uh, that's one that I learned from my chaplain a while ago. That's a, what's one he uses all the time with patients. What I, what are you hoping for? Yeah, that's a good takeaway. Because you'll you'll learn a lot based on there. Well, I'm looking just for more time with my family, and I'm looking to spend time at home. I'd love to get my pain under better control. And boom, you just learn so much about 
what they need. And then you can translate their treatment options to match that. You know, more chemotherapy, more diagnostic tests, more interventions. Gosh, that may not be what we need to do to get you at home with that quality time with your family. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but it just kind of came to mind when you said no, that. No, that's, that's exactly kind of what I'm thinking. What are you hoping for, you know? Yeah. And it's similar to, you know, I, I do most of my practice in sports medicine. That's right. And one of the best questions I ask people are, what is your mm-hmm. goal? What do you want to get out of our meetings? Like, do you yeah. want to be able to comb your hair without your shoulder Great. hurting? Do you want to be able to, to go running a marathon again? Great. And you're kind of taking that question, transitioning a little bit about, hey, what are you hoping to get out of your life and targeting your treatments accordingly? Yeah. I think that, that's a really great overview. Yeah. Well, um, I'd, like to, I'd like to keep this conversation going on forever. And I'm, <laughs> I've already thinking of like four other topics that we could probably be uh, talking on right. <laughs> uh, in the future. So we'll have to get you to come back and do yeah, one of these in the future. Anytime. But uh, first off, can you just give us a sense of how, if we wanted to send a patient to you, what's the best way to, to contact your office or yeah. get a patient to your office? Absolutely. There's multiple ways to do it. Um, certainly if you're within the Intermountain, Intermountain um, system, it's easy to just place an electronic consult, consult to palliative care, and it'll come to our outpatient care manager and she'll be able to contact the patient and set it up. Um, if you're outside of the Intermountain system, Certainly uh, a phone call can suffice for a referral or a fax. Um, I don't have all like the contact information in front of me as far as which, which num- numbers to dial, that sort of thing. Sure. But you can always also call the McKady Hospital operator and mm-hmm. they can uh, transfer you to the palliative care service. And you know, families and patients can self-refer too. Mm-hmm. So they don't always need a, you know, a physician order. Perfect. So multiple ways to do it, yeah. So would you be okay if we get your fax and phone number and put it in the episode notes yes, for this yeah, podcast? Yeah, I'd really appreciate that. Perfect. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, um, I think that's going to pretty much wrap it up. So thank you again yes, so of much. Yes, course. I uh, had a lot of fun. Me and too. I'm looking forward to some of the comments we get from this episode and really? we'll have to get you back to follow up on those. I love it. I do just need to mention that uh, while this is a medical podcast, if your responsibility as a medical provider to to judge the merits of the opinions you've heard on this and not just uh, blindly follow whatever we've said on here. Your provider, you need to do your own research. That's right. But um, also on top of that, the uh, the opinions, the comments expressed on this podcast are those of Dr. Fazio and myself and not of the Ogden Surgical Medical Society. Thank you again for listening. And I, we've got a lineup of great uh, speakers coming in for future podcasts in the next few weeks. So keep tuned and thank you very much. Great. Thank you.